from KCRW. This is Nocturne. I've done a lot of adventurous things. I've been like literally chased through Golden Gate Park at night. I've been camping in Tanzania and had hyenas fighting on top of me on top of my tent at night. I've almost drowned in the sea when it's dark. But in that moment, lost in the forest, I have never been so freaked out in my entire life. And I kept remembering that when I was a first year in in college, I'd taken a a psychology class. There's an exercise that the existentialists developed that they, they encouraged people to go into the forest and stay there all night without any food, any water, or any weapons for protection. And the idea was that once they emerged in the light of day, they would know the meaning of life and that they would they would feel like a pull towards what they were meant to do if they were meant for anything. And I kept saying like, you know, something good has to come of this. Maybe this will set us on the right track. Maybe we'll have a better idea about what we wanna be doing with our lives. Maybe we'll know what job we want because we were, you know, we were 23. <laughs> like we, we didn't know what we were doing. And we both started talking in this way, like once we make it out of this forest, I will start applying to graduate school or I will start thinking about my future a little more seriously or whatever, because that really was scary. More after this. Thank you for listening to this KCRW podcast. In case you don't know us, KCRW is public radio in Los Angeles, bringing the best of NPR to Southern California. We're also known for our own brand of bold and innovative programming, evocative storytelling, taste-making music, and audio documentaries that are little movies for your ears. You can join our community to support this show and others, or make a one-time donation just to say thank you. Find out more at kcrw.com slash join. Listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Zoe and Sarah, new teachers in their early 20s, had met through a mutual friend and traveled around Mexico for a couple of months in the summer. The trip had been fun and exhilarating. They were young and spontaneous and let the wind carry them where it might. When they returned, they still had some time before needing to go back to work, so they decided to go on a road trip in the Pacific Northwest. This is Zoe. Sarah has like a tiny commuter car. It was like a Mazda coupe. We decided to take a road trip and go as far north as we could in her car. We just decided to push it as far as we could and just packed our passports because we had no idea where we'd end up. And we just went north from San Francisco. We had the time and we'd had such an adventurous trip in Mexico and both of us are really adventurous in general. And there was no plan at all. We just knew we had to be back by a certain day because that's when I had to be home for work. We went to Washington and then we even ended up going as far as we could to Canada, to Vancouver. But the trip somehow was just really uneventful. We had seen really beautiful things and done this really great drive, obviously, but it really was nothing to write home about. As Zoe and Sarah were heading back home to Sacramento, they were in Oregon at this point, Zoe was on the phone with her mom, reassuring her that the trip had been uneventful and that she didn't need to worry. And right as I said that, we saw this sign for the Oregon sand dunes and just didn't know what it was. And I said, you know, mom, we just saw something that looks a little interesting and, um, and I'll call you back later. That was, I think, at like three or four in the afternoon. Zoe and Sarah go explore this beautiful natural wonder they discovered. They were being young and free and planless. They headed into the dunes at about 5 p.m. with no food, water, or lights. But they traveled together a lot, and things usually seemed to work out fine. It ended up being great. We walked for two hours, and the dunes are probably the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. We made it back right before dark. It just worked out. The planless, spontaneous thing had paid off once again. 
but things were about to change. Gosh, it probably starts when we exit the sand dunes. That's Sarah, Zoe's traveling companion and partner in spontaneity. Sarah always says, we're young, dumb, and beautiful. (laughs) We just sort of felt invincible. Sarah and Zoe need to be home in two days. They have a choice between the fast inland route that takes about nine hours or the iconic Highway 1 that winds along the coast. It was about 7 o'clock at this point. And we had this idea to just keep going to the coast and then camp and go home. We'd wanted to drive on the coast, and there was just this beautiful coastline. It was very foggy and very cold, and that's my favorite type of climate. We were just totally lost in the, in the beauty of all of this. But I don't think we anticipated that we would be driving through these towns that literally look like a mix of like a, an Edward Norton set and a Twin Peaks set. I mean, we were driving through, through these groves that were covered in flowers, and then the name of the town would be in these like light bulb signs over them. I mean, it was the physical embodiment of eeriness. We were thinking that we were just going to keep going by the coast, but after 12 hours, we got tired and night was coming. So I was like, Zoe, we should just cut across or find a way to, you know, get to the other side. We had really just wanted to drive and see as much as we could. That was our objective. So we were getting what we were looking for. But after a couple hours, I just told Zoe I didn't want to keep going on the coast if it's nighttime. I don't want to pull an all-nighter. So I asked Zoe to GPS, since I was the captain, she would be my co-pilot. And so I asked her just to find the quickest route from the coast of Oregon to the middle of, like, the I-5 that we can get to so I can go back to Sacramento. Zoe entered the information into the mapping app on her phone. So this map sent us basically down the one, and then we would have to turn left. I remember we'd have to turn left onto this street called Elk River Road and take Elk River Road for about 40 miles, and that would spit us right out. So she GPSs us and says, yeah, you can cut through this forest, and it'll have a little highway, and you can cut up to the I-5. I had a full tank of gas when we were leaving the sand dunes, which was nice, so I had about 300 miles in there, enough to get to this destination that Zoe had GPSed us to. Neither of us had had any dinner. We had really wanted to just get as far as we could because we had quite a ways to go. The map on Zoe's phone seemed pretty straightforward. It looked like they would drive for 40 or 50 miles and just pick up the freeway. And we had decided at that point, like, we'll find a motel and pull off for the night and then finish the drive in the morning. That had been our plan from the get-go. So Zoe's just like, yeah, just cut it left here and then we'll go. It's 10 o'clock. We turn onto Elk River Road. And it started off fine. The sun's just barely setting. It's gorgeous out there. Um, There's a couple of houses, and then, you know, the sun just sets. And so we're still driving, and supposedly this is supposed to be 50 miles. I'm like, okay, this is totally doable. Like, we got a whole tank of gas, and we only need to do 50 miles, and if something happens, we could just turn back around. So when we get into Elk River Road, I don't really realize that we're driving into a forest. It's just presented to me as as a road. When we start driving, there's lampposts and electricity and light. There are houses sort of steadily getting more and more spaced apart. And it's paved road. And there are a few moments where the road turns into more like gravel. But then it becomes road again. But as we kept driving, the lights disappeared and the houses disappeared as well. And the reception on my phone also disappeared. And we'd had it when we started, but we lost cell service really fast. And fortunately, this map had been loaded when we had the reception. So we had the map at least. And we started to see cars pulled off to the side of the road with people probably sleeping in them. You know, you're just like, okay, so I don't see any campgrounds or anything, but there are like a bunch, like two or three cars that are just pulled off the road with the sun visor on all the windows. So it kind of got that eerie feeling from the beginning. But but we ha- were really, really intent on making it these 40 miles because we just had too much way to go. We end up keep going, keep going, and then night comes and we're still going down this road. It's still paved. And then all of a sudden it just turns into gravel. 
and there's weeds everywhere and my car is really low to the ground. So I keep hitting all these plants and the rocks are shooting up into my engine. The road became gravel when we had 37 miles left. It was very windy and we had no idea where we were driving. Once the road didn't um, turn back into pavement, I think Sarah started getting anxious. It was very, very dark. So we couldn't see the road. We could only feel it on Sarah's car because Sarah's car was a commuter car. It wasn't meant to be off-road. It wasn't meant to be driving anything gravelly. She doesn't have four-wheel drive. The only light we had was from our headlights. I could really, really see the sky out of the front of her, her car at the window. And then all of a sudden, these huge evergreen trees would just totally swallow us up and you couldn't see the sky anymore. It was all just canopy and dense dark. You could only really see what was in front of you. I couldn't even see what was off to the side of me. Going further and further into this forest, you just see shadows and you think, you know, there's weeds coming out of the road. For a split second, I don't know if there's like a person in the road. A family of deer just popped out in front of the car. We had to jerk to a stop. When I really hit my brakes and... I mean, it, it was very scary. It was so dark. It was so, so dark. Yeah, it was just completely black except my car. You can only see my car lights. Around this time, Zoe and Sarah's adventurous spirits started showing signs of wear. This wasn't how the rest of their travels together had played out. The map was not matching up with what they were seeing around them. It just felt wrong. We couldn't see a thing. It wasn't paved. Something felt like we were we had done it wrong. So I zoomed out of the map and we were basically like this blue dot that had become gray because we no longer had reception. And the blue line that was leading us through on this road, Elk River Road, <laughs> was was smack dab in the middle of all this green. I only realized we were in a forest when I zoomed out of the map and saw, really to my horror, oh, okay, it looks like we're in a forest. And I was under the impression that this was just a regular road, but it was actually a fire road. But it wasn't road that cars are meant to drive on. But Zoe's like, we're 20 miles away. So I'm like, okay, I will just keep going and we'll be totally fine. Um, and we go like that for probably like an hour. And we have just the map on her phone and we're just trusting and following this road because there was nothing else to turn off or on on. Sarah and Zoe had committed to driving down this progressively less inviting road with the expectation that they would pop up in civilization after 40 or 50 miles. They were about to have another unpleasant surprise. All of a sudden we, I'm like, Zoe, okay, my gas tank is like halfway now. And it was full like an hour ago. My gas tank tells me how many miles I have on that tank. So I started out with 348. But we were noticing that the amount of gas it was taking to get one physical mile, according to the map, were not synced. Like, I think one mile, according to the map, took about eight to 10 gallons of Sarah's gas. I don't know if we're on like a weird road or like we're not moving. I don't know what's happening. It was time stop still, but our car is going. So we weren't sure if we were even gonna make it out to the road. My, actually, one of my fears is to be stuck in a forest at night. So I'm like getting a little sweaty. And I think because Sarah was so flipped out, I knew I needed to stay calm in order for us to be able to keep driving. According to their calculations, Zoe and Sarah had gone about 20 miles, about halfway to what was hopefully maybe the freeway. And they maybe were not going to have enough gas to make it through. I don't know what we were thinking. I can't remember why we decided it was smarter to keep driving to the end as opposed to turning around. Sarah, behind the steering wheel, was now moving beyond sweaty. As swallowed up as we were by the trees, like, that's how swallowed up she was by her fear. Like, she was really, really getting scared. And... I mean, she's backpacked everywhere. She leads kids on backpacking trips. I live by rural areas, and it's not scary to me. Like, I'm not afraid of being in the wilderness. But I think what was scariest about this was it, we really couldn't see anything. And she was the one driving the car. 
she could have driven straight and not realized she maybe was driving off a cliff. Like, we just really had no idea what was underneath us or in front of us or behind us or to the side of us. I think I just really dissociated from the situation because I was, uh, it was so terrifying. If I had really thought of what was happening as we are driving through the pitch black forest at night with limited gas, no food, very little water, um, no cell phone service, and like really no, no clue about where we were. I had no idea if there were bears or other animals. Honestly, and for me, I would probably be more afraid of people. Like, I don't know what kind of people lurk around in a forest at night. I've only seen horror movies about this stuff. You know, your imagination starts going wild in the dark, especially mine. I have a very wild imagination I've always had. Sarah was getting more and more worked up. She kept asking me, like, please, like, please, can we switch? Can you drive? Can you drive, please? And I said, you know, I, I understand that you're scared, but this road seems really difficult to drive. And due to my inexperience with driving, I don't think it's smart for us to switch. So she's like, it's okay, you know, we're probably, you said 20 miles like 20 minutes ago, so we're probably like 10 or 5 miles away. I'm like, yeah, sounds good. So we go another 30, 40 minutes doing this, and again, it's still the gravel. We see, like, my car, I try to do high beams to see, like, you know, around me, because I'm getting a little frightened, because I just don't like being in a dark area, especially in the forest. I just don't know why it scares me. And eventually, Sarah says, can you start counting down? Can you start telling me how many miles we had left? 19 miles left. 18 miles left. 17 miles left. I think when she asked me to start reading the numbers off, it was about 11 o'clock. So eventually, we start driving in this one part of Elk River Road that the road changed again it became really soft. Like, it wasn't dirt, though. I couldn't really tell what it was, but it became a lot damper. It became a lot foggier and darker. And we could start seeing, like, there are all of these trees cut down. And, and, and I think this started when we had about five miles left. So I just sort of said, you know, five, very affirmatively. And, but we're getting so excited. You know, we have five miles left. I think it would just turn midnight, actually. We're so, so close. We're so, so tired. We've just gone through this insane, like, th you know, 37 miles of pitch black forest. Like, we were so, so ready to be out of there. And we had so little left. And so I eventually count down. I'm like, four, three, so he's like, I think we're about to hit the freeway to take us to the I-5. And I'm like, thank God. And we're creeping on this really soft ground. And we look right directly in front of us on the road. And we see it's just like like a pile of, of logs completely obstructing the road. And it's a dead end. We see this barricade. They just chopped the road off. We have no way out. Like, it just wasn't road anymore. It was just the definition of a dead end. I said, oh my God, it's a, it's a dead end. I just fall silent. And I think she almost started to cry. Because she had almost cried a few times throughout the drive. I just lose it. I just start getting super stressed out. I'm like, Zoe, I can't. We can't do this. We can't be in the middle of the forest. We don't know what's out here. When we hit that roadblock, I just, my fear of just being in a forest, like secluded basically, just hit me. And I'm like freaking out. I'm rocking back and forth. I'm like, Zoe, you need to take over. Like, I can't function right now. Like, I can't think. Zoe's trying to be calm for Sarah but she can feel her own panic building. I've done a lot of adventurous things. I've been like literally chased through Golden Gate Park at night. I've been camping in Tanzania and had hyenas fighting on top of me, on top of my tent at night. I've almost drowned in the sea when it's dark. But in that moment, seeing that dead end, I have never been so freaked out in my entire life. Because keep in mind that we had been calculating in terms of gas when this 
off sync situation where the odometer and the map weren't syncing up. And we definitely did not have enough gas left. It just turned midnight. Morning would not come for a long time. Light would not come for a long time. Sarah was so scared that her nervous system was taking over in a very inconvenient way, one that necessitated her getting out of the car and squatting nearby. So she she did that and she and she got back in the car and she just started hyperventilating and and really really crying and I just said like okay, you're not going to like this, but I think we need to just stay here for the rest of the night because it's too late and it's too dark and we just have no idea what's here. But first we need to turn the car around so that it's not facing the dead end, that it's facing the actual road because in case something does come and we need to drive away. But for now, we just need to turn off the car so that we don't waste any battery on it and and just stay and just stay here. When I turned my car around, I turned off my headlights, then boom, it's just pitch black. You can't see anything. And that was the first time that we had been really in the dark. And it was so dark, I couldn't see. I couldn't see that I had a body beneath me. Like, I couldn't see that Sarah was beside me. I can't see 10 feet away from my car. It's just like I was dropped in a cloak of like a black fabric. And so I'm freaking out because I'm just like, you know, I just hope we make this out alive. Like, I just want to live after this. Something about that forest, it just, everything seemed off. Like, it just, something in the air wasn't right. It was too quiet. Every part of it just didn't feel right. So we had about five and a half hours left. And I can't sleep, so, because I'm the only one that can drive. So if I fall asleep and something happens, like... I would have to startle, wake up, and then try to, you know, get the car going. We're not sleeping. Because what if, you know, what if, what if, what if? So I was like, Zoe, can we just stay up together and just talk to each other? I think because it was like this really messed up sleepover that we had just sort of gotten ourselves stuck in, we just started sharing really deep secrets because, of course, secrets are the best way to stay awake. (laughs) It was like talking about my childhood and talking about my life. And then she was telling me about her struggles and tribulations. It was just like, when we get out of this, we have to tell that person we're sorry. We have to tell this person we love them more. And I'm not a physically affectionate person, really, but we held hands the entire five and a half hours. There are so many ways to feel about what happened to Zoe and Sarah. I can completely relate to the fear they experienced. And I could also imagine someone else thinking, what's the big deal? But their fear wasn't silly. Humans have good reason to be afraid of the dark. We're pre-programmed for it from our time as hunter-gatherers, when fear of the dark was adaptive and kept us safe from predators. And if you look at a satellite map of Elk River Road between the coast and I-5, and imagine being stranded out there at night, and you don't break out in a cold sweat, you're a badass. It turns out that the area they were stranded in was called Wild Rogue Wilderness. But still, there aren't really that many predators anymore in the night, and they were so deep in the forest that there couldn't be many people, if any. I think a lot of it was our imagination, based on scary movies where it's like literally these two young women getting lost in a forest. Like, what's going to happen other than getting nearly murdered? This was just a perfect storm. That's what just kept going through my head. I'm like, you know, this is how murder movies are made. Like, we're in a plot right now that someone's going to come and grab us. If we scream in this forest, no one's going to know. We're just two girls from California. We need help. We're stranded. No one knows we're here. We lost cell service. We are perfect bait to get murdered. I was thinking about, like, a bear. And in the back of my mind also, I was thinking about people. Like, if some ill-intentioned person was lurking around in the forest and coming at us. We're two women, and all I have is pepper spray. Like, what is going to happen if, like, two guys come or a guy can really overpower us or if they have, like, a weapon or something? Like, when you're in this pitch-black forest with only your car, I mean... You're kind of a sitting duck, you know, you don't know what's out there, but something might know you're there. We would both sort of stop mid-talking and say, like, do you feel like someone's watching us right now? 
you know that feeling when someone's eyes are on you. You can feel that. And, and we would both feel that, like, at the exact same time. And that happened probably three or four times in the night. I was like, Zoe, I just feel like someone in a gray hoodie is outside. And she was just like, you know, that's funny. I thought the same thing earlier. I would imagine, like, a hooded rapist at Sarah's window. But I think it was very much in our heads. Because we hadn't seen any creatures or any people. We were so by ourselves. So... I'm talking to Zoe and she's in the passenger side and she starts reclining her chair. And I'm just like looking at her and I'm yelling at her. I'm like, I'm awake, like you gotta stay awake with me. I can't fall asleep. If we fall asleep, like and someone comes to our car, like I need to be awake so I can just turn that engine on and zoom out. And she's like, yeah, don't worry, I'll, I'll stay awake with you. So I start talking to her and just telling her stories. And then I look over and she's asleep. I think I slept for about an hour and a half. She didn't sleep, she stayed up the entire night. Five o'clock rolls around and the sun breaks. And the minute I can see that there's a little bit of light, I just shove her awake. And Sarah woke me up the second the sun rose. I'm like, Zoe, it's morning, we're going. I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> I'm gonna live to tell this tale. When the sun came out, I was relieved. But, you know, we didn't wake up to just being able to drive on out of there. We still had quite a bit to figure out. We were trying to decide whether it made the most sense to walk the three and a half miles to the road that was allegedly there, or to drive back and just find a campsite or someone with gas if we could, because we didn't know how much gas we really had. Zoe and Sarah took a bet that they'd have enough gas to find help and drove back down the road they came in on. In the dawning light, everything felt different. You know, it looks so beautiful in the morning. Just, it was such a different moment. Like, we looked out and we we're on a cliff. We were on a cliff somewhere and you just look out and you just see all this forest and it was just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. I could finally see where we had been driving the night before. It was just beautiful. It was like being inside of a room with the lights off and pitch black and then the lights on again and seeing that the room was filled with like presence. Even though it was so uncertain what would happen next in terms of gas, it did feel comforting that it was daytime. And like every good horror movie, the scares don't let up after the first sigh of relief. The sun rose, Zoe and Sarah relaxed into the fact that nothing evil had emerged from the darkness of night, and they drove back down the road looking for someone with cell phone reception or gas they could buy. They came upon a secluded campground, parked their car near the entrance, and walked down the hill into the site, thinking they might even find a park ranger. They still felt shaken by their night stranded in the woods, so they agreed they wouldn't tell their whole story to whoever they found. They saw an RV that had kids' toys strewn around and several tanks of gas nearby, and though it was early, they knocked on the door. A woman looked out furtively, wouldn't open the door, and said her kids were sleeping and they needed to go away. She refused to help even when they told her what they'd been through. As they walked away from the motorhome, a man approached, asking if that was their car on the road. This guy looked, he just looked like your average Joe. He was probably like 50 years old, he was balding, he had like really blue eyes. They immediately told him everything about how they were lost and no one knew where they were. And as they walked back toward the road, one thing after another started feeling wrong. The second, like literally the second we were near our cars again, I immediately, immediately, everything shifted and I felt completely flipped out by him. I can't explain it. Just suddenly, I just started getting the worst, worst vibe from him. He was kind of fidgety. He was kind of like, he kept shrugging, he kept like fidgeting with his hands. He put his hands in and out of his pockets a lot. He was um, walking around. He couldn't stand still. Things the man was saying were not adding up. He wasn't really offering any help. He was trying to get them to come over to his car, and he was asking them a lot of strange questions. He kept on asking, like, what did you see? Like, where were you? Could you just tell me a little bit more about where you were? And he goes, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? 
he was really trying to figure out where we had been the night before and really, really, really wanted to know what we had seen. Like, was very, very concerned with what we had seen. He kept wanting to bring us closer and closer to his car. After he asked what, what we saw, what we saw that night, he, he locked eyes with me. And I didn't realize until that moment that he locked eyes with me that he had been avoiding my eye contact the whole time. And when he locked eyes with me, I mean, it was your classic shiver down your spine, cold body sensation, cold sweat, absolute utter panic. I, that really scared me. Also, he had been wearing really, really light blue jeans that were quite thick. And I notice about midway down his pant that there's a stain there. And so I'm like trying to maintain eye contact without making it clear that I'm I'm observing him. But I really quickly like glance down and notice that like the the stain looks like dried blood. It definitely looks like dried blood. I mean it was really ter- it was terrifying. That was that was scarier than any darkness I could ever have been in. I I feel like he knew. I think he saw my car go down. I don't know if he saw my car go all the way down to where it is, but I definitely believe he saw my car sometime in that night when we were descending down. And I know that that feeling I had, there was something watching me. And I, that's the whole reason why I just was like, I, we need to get out of here. Like, I don't want to be here. And so it just makes sense now with all those questions he was asking that, he did see me. He saw my car because for him to ask, is that your car? Like out of all the questions, like I don't understand why that was his main objective. That really gave rise to a lot of what scary stories try to warn you about. <laughs> you know, like that really um, made me feel like, yeah, like this is a legitimate fear. This is, it is very, very appropriate to get lost in the forest at night and fear that there will be some sort of murder out there in the woods. Because as far as I can tell, this guy probably had just done that. He had definitely done something. While Sarah and Zoe are pretty convinced that the guy at the campsite had been up to no good the night before, and that he'd seen their car while he was doing whatever he was doing, they got away from him without incident, with their hearts in their throats. And they'll never really know if they were in actual danger, or if the residue of their fearful night colored the whole experience the next morning. So we just kept driving. We really pushed it. Somehow we made it to the end of the road and literally three minutes away from the entrance of the road was a gas station. So we just went to the gas station. We filled up our tank. She called her mom crying. I called my best friend crying. And um, we figured out how to get on the less scenic route. And we drove the entire day back home. And eventually, after about three or four hours, we called the police and reported him. And I had, I had memorized his license plate, so at least we could give them that. And for months afterwards, I kept looking up any news related to Elk River Road or Elk River Forest, which I think is what it's called. I, kept, I really was looking, but nothing, nothing ever came of it. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. The show is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Nick White is our senior editor. Nocturne is distributed by KCRW and also receives support from KCRW's Independent Producer Project. You can find more information about Nocturne at our website, nocturnepodcast.org. Let us know about your stories about the night, darkness, or the unseen landscape at hello at nocturnepodcast.org. Thanks for listening. 